Um, well, good evening. Um, I'm going to talk um, about my work. There are many approaches that I could take for this talk, but um, yeah, I chose to focus on my garden, um, which is one of the main elements um, that I use in my work. It's actually um, <clears throat> well, I show you a picture first of the garden. It's a garden on a rooftop of a parking lot in the center of Brussels. Um, it's close to my uh, apartment, which is also my studio. And um, I, uh, I will tell you about how I made this garden and for what I use it and so on in my art. Um, there is one other important element in the garden that are my honeybees and actually from uh, the honeybees everything started. The garden came after the bees, first the bees then the flowers. So um, yeah, my rooftop garden is my laboratory and um, it is my training ground to, create, to develop my creativity and it enables me to have an active dialogue with the living material that I grow in the garden. Uh, it is a space where thinking and manual work go hand in hand and it connects the visible with the invisible and brings together making and performing. So my art is based on the collaboration with living organisms that live and grow in the garden, such as plants, my honeybees and bacteria. And uh, I research um, the ecosystem they are, they are part of, the natural networks they form and um, complementary to my training as an artist, I did studies in botanics, which is very useful for my art. This is the rooftop without garden. Um, it, you can see the center of Brussels in the background and um, under uh, the snowy rooftop there is a um, big parking lot. What you see here is approximately one-fourth of the total surface of the parking lot. I convinced the people, the owners, um, to give me the authorization to make a rooftop garden. This took approximately two years to convince them. But then finally uh, I could start. And uh, such a garden, it's not um, made on five minutes. Uh, you have uh, really to work together with architects and engineers to um, search for the structure, to, to control the structure of uh, the roof, if it's strong enough to put um, uh, that heavy weight on it. Um, here you see the pipes, um, they came up um, through my uh, apartment and then uh, they are, um, yeah, via the pipes they brought up the lava substrate um, that is mixed with soil and um, it was like uh, approximately one day that it took to put, um, to fill um, the surface that I um, was transforming. Here you can see the surface. Later I made um, a similar surface on the second level where you see the snow still there. But this I did uh, two years later. Um, so you see also the green structure. Um, this is my little studio that I built on the rooftop. I also built a greenhouse and in those two spaces I do all my uh, experiments and then I have um, other places to work um, in uh, the more for the clean work, let's say. This is more or less um, how it looks yeah, now two years ago in spring, it was springtime. Um, the, um, the fruit, uh, fruit trees are flowering. All the trees and all the herbs, all the grasses and all the flowers that are put are um, put there um, with two purposes or they are favorable for the honeybees and other insects or um, they are good for people to eat. So there are not, no ornamental uh, botanics, it's only useful botanics, mainly fruit trees um, and a lot of wild 
wild herbs and a lot of flowers. Um, this is another um, point of view. And um, this is then the greenhouse in the second part. And um, in the greenhouse um, I grow things, but I use it also often to do experiments. Um, maybe some of you have already seen the video that is here in my installation. There you, you see a little bit um, uh, the things in action. Here um, I was working on my, um, my skins and on the, the pollen um, with which I, I was making also other skins for my guerrilla beehive, but I will talk about that later. Um, so the greenhouse is used um, for to ferment things. For example, here I am uh, fermenting um, kombucha. Uh, I don't use it for drinking, yeah, very seldom. I, I make kombucha for drinking. I um, mainly use it for uh, growing skins and to do other experiments uh, with bacteria. Uh, there you see also on the bottom some skins um, that are growing in a very large aquarium outside in the garden. Here is another point of view to the city and on the foreground you see um, a an, uh, big beehive. Uh, it's called the uh, Elbe Bienen Beehive. Uh, I put this in Hamburg. Um, it's like it was a commission art in public space, but I come later on to that. But it had a sister one in Brussels, and I was monitoring the bees that were as well in Brussels as in Hamburg, and comparing their uh, behavior. And left you see like uh, a lot of uh, ivy. I uh, covered all um, the soil with ivy because this is a super important plant for the honeybee colonies before they have to go to winter. They have to um, harvest a lot of pollen um, to uh, maintain the winter and to have them in spring to feed uh, the, their babies, actually, because the babies are fed with pollen. Um, this um, is some artworks that we did in the garden. Actually, this garden is the garden from an organization I was part of, um, which was called OCNO. It's an uh, artist-run organization in Brussels. And uh, with OCNO, um, with my colleague artists, um, we worked a lot around art and technology, um, all kinds of experiments. And um, on a certain moment, we uh, started to work only outside. This is the moment also that I started to work with honeybees and to observe them and so on. So in this one, um, we were um, like measuring the sap flows in flowers and then uh, translating the data into a sound performance in the evening. Uh, this is another, um, yeah, another data translation actually. Uh, that um, is uh, coming from the garden. To the left you see a wind clock. This is um, a modern update of a wind clock uh, model of Leonardo da Vinci. Um, it's working with an optical sensor. You see there on the bottom the gray scale. So, um, well, this, this thing with orange tape is flapping in the wind, so it's moving with the wind, and then it goes up or down the grayscale um, levels, and um, uh, these data are translated towards a database that I made with all the names of uh, all flowers and plants in the garden, and it's a program in MaxMSP that uh, just uh, shows the names in different um, uh, different um, font um, sizes, yeah, yeah, font sizes um, along the strongness of the wind, and then it overrides always in black and white itself, so to come to a um, completely abstract. Um, painting or rendering towards uh, the end. 
Um, here um, I have my honey bees with a lot of pollen. Um, yeah, bees always are busy um, taking pollen and taking honey, uh, nectar. But the pollen is something super special and this took my attention and I wanted to know like uh, a lot of beekeepers that um, keep the bees like for their behavior. They want to know where their bees are going to. So I try to follow, but this is impossible of course. Um, you can try out some things with RFID and so on, um, because only RFID is light enough to put on, on a honeybee, but then you need to put all um, these uh, RFID readers everywhere, which is nearly impossible. So um, I uh, used more or less my imagination um, to think about the flight routes of the honeybees in the city by uh, trying to map the nectar sources, so by uh, mapping more the plants in the city. But first of all, um, I tried to do a pollen study and I collected pollen um, that the honeybees brought back to the beehive and I also collected pollen immediately on the flowers and then I was working um, in a collaboration with a scientist of the University of Brussels to study this pollen uh, under the microscope, the scanning electron microscope, which gives uh, some kind of three-dimensional rendering uh, to the objects that you study and um, it gives uh, very interesting images and especially it makes really the invisible visible because it can magnify up to 100,000 uh, times. So in an um, order you see here the big image is the, the last half millimeter of the tongue of a honeybee the tongue of a honeybee is approximately six millimeters long in total. So this is less than one millimeter, what you see here. It's magnified 250 times, which is not that much. Um, but you see that the tongue um, in the middle, there is like some kind of tube. And then there are a lot of hairs. And uh, so a bee can suck the nectar through the tube, but it can also leach like a dog is licking water. Um, so it has these two possibilities to collect nectar in the flowers along um, the construction of the flower. And what you see also, and um, this is uh, more frightening actually, all the irregular uh, little stones that you see, that's uh, pollution, fine dust. So when you see that there is already so much pollution on half a millimeter, then you can understand how much pollution these animals take with them when they go out foraging. Um, also, their hairs are um, electrostatically loaded, um, uh, so they attract even more the pollution particles uh, than normal. And then when they come in the beehive and they are super close to each other, they pass immediately all this um, pollution to each other. Other images that you see here are like uh, the one next to the bee tongue is the comb, which is called a pollen comb. With that comb, they comb the pollen in a little pollen basket. Um, next to it is a mandible of um, the mouth of the bee. And then we have hairs. Um, bees have collections of hairs. Um, soft ones, um, stiff ones, uh, it's like very hairy animals and uh, they have it in all forms and sizes. Um, there to the left, um, uh, in the bottom, um, it, are, it are hairs in the eye of a honeybee. So this is the form that is curved. It's um, yeah, like we have eyebrows, they have the hairs in their panoptical eyes. 
and then all the other um, pictures or all pictures of pollen, so sunflower pollen, the one in the middle is a mint pollen, borage we have there and uh, trifolium uh, at the bottom. So um, yeah, from that I knew a little bit like, uh, okay, this is the, the pollen that they bring in for the moment. Uh, it's also because this pollen are super beautiful um, form-wise and uh, yeah, I, I was very interested in it only for the forms already. Um, this is um, a map of uh, the center of Brussels where I um, tried to make a connected open green via the beehives that I put in the city, mainly on um, different rooftops. So you have my rooftop, you have the rooftop of our organization OCNO, then you have uh, other rooftops of cultural organizations along the canal and uh, in some parks. And I was mapping all um, possible good nectar sources around these areas and we took also recordings um, we did silent walks for example along these roads and um, all these things with um, yeah in in the form of workshops with people and uh, and so on and this is a totally different um, uh, work that comes forth from my rooftop garden. It's a remake of a, a reenactment of my rooftop garden in an exhibition. So it's inside in um, a huge uh, building, a bit like here, uh, but it was bigger. Well, it was a factory, an old factory building. Uh, without windows, I mean, so similar to here, so no immediately uh, daylight connection. And um, the curator asked me to make a reenactment uh, of my garden, which, which was huge work. I was working for four months on this. Um, and um, it's 200 square meters. Well, my own garden is 750 square meters, but here I had a room of 200 square meters, which is like, was four times this room approximately. And um, I uh, made all arrangements with sponsors and stuff to give sponsoring for the soil, for example. Um, the, it's 52 tons of uh, lava soil uh, that we have there and um, with um, uh, yeah, um, tree growers and um, all this kind of stuff. So it's really, it was with um, cranes and so on that we brought up everything. Um, but we succeeded also in big collaboration with um, the people from that city uh, that donated a lot of plants, uh, vegetables that were helping me to plant um, and to maintain um, the whole thing, uh, connections with schools and so on. Um, so in the first two images here you see like a simulation, one that I made in Photoshop, the upper one just uh, from elements from my own garden that I put in a picture of um, this uh, factory place. And then uh, the, the other one is a simulation in Blender uh, that we made to see how we would arrange uh, the whole garden. Um, this is yeah, uh, one part of it. I had four different parts, the vegetable garden, the herb garden, the Mediterranean garden and the forest garden. And um, all these four different gardens were uh, monitored. Um, well, the whole space actually was monitored because as there was no window, I had special lighting uh, for plants. Um, the, from there, the, the pink, uh, a bit uh, pink uh, kindish um, atmosphere in the pictures. And then um, on the pillar, but you don't see the graphs, 
we monitored, uh, of course, also the temperature, humidity, and uh, uh, all these basic things, um, which were then uh, sent and streamed on the internet, and so I could follow also from home uh, what was happening. And um, yeah, I invited the public to collaborate when they had um, specific questions or whatever, when they had ideas. Um, there was a huge blackboard on which they could uh, write some stuff and also every plant had an, um, a QR code uh, um, with information and they were all in the database. And then there were also artworks in the garden. Um, I had uh, a beehive, but with um, uh, a, a recording that I made of, of my beehives, but a recording of a whole year that was compressed in 11 hours, a time lapse, and that was shown in a small peephole beehive. And then there were some screens with um, short videos of some artifacts that happened in my own garden, like small poetic renderings um, and um, small visual poems, let's say. So um, there you see more or less a bit of dimensions when you see the person over there. And, um, <clears throat> Yeah, it was, it was huge work to maintain it, um, the more that it was in winter. The exhibition opened in November and was running till the end of February. Just uh, the most the bad moment for, for plants actually. But like they maintained themselves rather well. There were some pests, of course. Um, that I had to fight, and, but at the other hand there were also animals that were born, like um, butterflies and small insects and so on. So my, um, the bee agency is another strain of my work. Um, I worked for a long time with bees in all different kinds of setups, mainly to monitor their behavior and to learn from this and um, to make a link with nature and uh, to make works like uh, that are forthcoming uh, from this research. Um, it's like uh, studying the regulations of the beehive. Um, here, um, yeah, I, I set up a lot of different kinds of monitoring systems. Every year I built some observation beehives, um, so which were mainly regular beehives that um, I transformed inside with uh, cameras, infrared cameras, um, uh, because uh, the bees they see red as black, so they, they don't have any problem with pink or infrared light. Um, then, um, yeah, everything was connected to computers that were streamed, uh, data were streamed over the internet, um, uh, recordings were made, uh, video recordings, sound recordings. Um, it was a rather huge uh, job to maintain this all day in, day out, um, but um, yeah, that's why I came back now to more simple things actually than technology because I was a bit fed up by all this technology always breaking down. Here is a video uh, that I made uh, from the data that were recorded during this um, uh, seasons in the beehive. Uh, it's a comparison that you can make. I could compare every day with every other day. So here we have two days in the month of April. It's the, ninth, the 4th of April and the 9th of April. The 4th is a lot colder than the 9th. 9th. And we see here um, these four wheels. The wheels represent the um, high temperature, the higher the temperature, the whiter the wheels. The um, basic turnaround is uh, the audio uh, brightness data and then the real um, turnaround of these particles. 
um, is um, the motion tracking at the flight hall of uh, the beehive. And when you follow at the same time uh, the, uh, the clocks, then you see that real action is between 10.30 in the morning till 3.30 um, p.m., something like that, and then it slows down immediately. And um, yeah, you see that uh, yeah, they are quite, again, inside. But you can also see the difference between the two days, that the second one, the beehive, is already a lot warmer at the inside than to the left. Uh, day which is like one week earlier. This is work which is called the transparent beehive. Um, it's uh, also a work that I presented for a whole year um, in a small studio um, above our uh, organization and I invited the public to come and check uh, whenever they wanted and uh, I could give some explanations because it's a transparent beehive based uh, on the work of uh, Francis Huber who is a scientist from the 17th century, an entomologist, uh, he did a lot of research on bees and uh, he made some uh, observation beehives in the forms of books uh, through which uh, we could like um, uh, go and um, really read the life of a honeybee colony. Um, I transformed it a little bit and I made a library out of it. Um, this thing is like the modern libraries um, that you can slide and roll open. So um, these uh, frames are put on sliders. Here you see it better, you see the frames. And there to the left you see that they are put on sliders. And all the plexi sides of the hive um, were ab able to open. So I could open them and then slide them open and uh, observe and film uh, easily all, all uh, the action of the bees. On top of the frames you see these free amplifiers and then um, on the bottom, but you don't see that, it's under the wooden uh, plank. Um, are the amplifiers and so there were 12 frames, 12 channels and in the beehive itself you can see it better here. Um, I put all uh, contact microphones on which the bees were walking and um, this tripling made some sounds but the more that the bees started, started to build comp on the frames, the more the sound changed because uh, it's like um, a speaker and um, so the fuller it is, um, the less loud uh, it became or the sound was transformed. Um, and also because the colony was growing, uh, the sound was changing. And uh, then I was able to make some mixes uh, with the 12 channels um, underneath. Um, this one, it's another one, it's um, uh, called the Guerrilla Beehive. And um, so after my observations um, of the fixed beehives in my uh, open air studio garden, uh, I decided to make a project um, to, that was like in favor of the bees to help them because bees when they reproduce they, they swarm so the colony splits into this happens mainly once a year sometimes twice a year um, so a new queen is born and the old queen leaves the beehive and goes in search for a new place to live but um, my bee colonies, um, being in the city, uh, I was like wondering, okay, where are they going? Uh, they, they cannot find nice homes because um, our bees are domesticated and they cannot live in the open. It's too cold also uh, in um, Europe uh, to, to live in the open uh, as they can do in Asia, for example. So um, they go mainly in um, uh, roof, roof uh, conventional rooftops 
or chimneys or this kind of stuff. And then I decided to make like a refuge, a home uh, for swarming bees, which is called my guerrilla beehive, that you can just add anywhere, like to the, the side of a house or whatever, and where the bees could um, build a new home. I did some research for that uh, in a lot of papers uh, with scientists that uh, really study this kind of homes for bees, the ideal home for bees. And along these findings, I started to build uh, my beehive. Um, but there was still an observational element in it. You can see the little solar panel and the camera um, that is pointing to the entrance. And this is like to observe the bees and um, without opening the beehive. Because opening a beehive is very intrusive for a bee colony. They need a week to um, uh, maintain again uh, the homeostasis in the colony. Um, this is another bee project, it's this art in public space in the city of Hamburg, Germany. Um, I, uh, a creator asked me to um, uh, develop um, some project with my beehive after he had seen uh, my guerrilla beehives uh, presented at Ars Electronica. And um, I, um, I visited uh, several spots in the city of Hamburg and then I chose this spot which is a little bit outside of the harbour. It's a huge uh, pillar, as you can see there in the back, a metal construction. And uh, we decided to put the beehive on this metal construction. Next to it there is a very big natural park, so there was uh, more than enough food for the bees. And uh, it's also um, um, a zone of recreation for the people of Hamburg, where they can do some sports and um, like, um, yeah, all uh, kind of outdoors activities. And there is a very nice cafe on the ponton. The left beehive is positioned on a ponton and the ponton goes with the tides up and down. Sometimes it goes, uh, well, it go can go up, up till three meters, more than half of the, um, of the metal pillar, and then it goes down. So the people would be able to come closer to the bees and then see them from further away. Um, along the moments that they, that they were there. Um, the bees enter from the bottom in this beehive, so the, the people were able to look inside. And here you see it's like um, on top of the metal construction. There is also a camera and there were uh, sensors in the beehive to monitor uh, again and to have an idea how the colony was doing without opening um, the beehive. Here you see it from different sides. And this one, but it's in slow motion. Uh, here you see how the bees go inside. This hole is really on the bottom. And then we had the temperature um, inside and outside. And we had also other sensors that are not here in this um, information, but that the people could see uh, in um, the little cafe next doors, uh, because there was like several monitors that uh, displayed um, the information from inside, for example, like this. And there you see like two uh, different uh, comparisons because it's, I did the same in Brussels. And so we could compare the colony from Brussels and the colony from Hamburg on the same moment and to see how they were doing uh, on the same time. Then uh, my laboratory for form and matter is another strain of my work and uh, this is mainly uh, the things um, where I work with um, matter. Uh, I research the 
mainly the organic matter. For example, also the skins um, are part um, of this strain of work. The pollen. Here I, um, I was collaborating with um, biologists in the open bio lab of Brussels and uh, because I tried to make a perfume, the smell of the beehive. Um, I um, had a residency there for one year so I could work in the lab and um, I was doing some distillations. Here uh, to the left um, I did some pollen distillations and the right is a honey distillation but I distilled at, um, for that same project also um, well I did pollen, honey, wax, dead honeybees and um, mm, what is the fifth thing? Yeah, I forgot the fifth, but five elements anyways that uh, from which I made some distillations on different manners and then I mixed them, I made different kind of mixes to make the perfume that I uh, named the smell of the beehive because when you work with honeybees, when you open the cover of a beehive there is suddenly like um, a cloud of heat and smell that comes up and every beehive has its specific smell like um, it's very sweet and a bit um, yeah difficult to explain in English <laughs> um, it's it's a very specific smell and I try to recreate that smell with all the elements that one can find in a beehive and then later I did this collaboration um, with uh, Guerlain um, for a project that I had at uh, Palais de Tokyo in Paris I was telling and giving all these elements to Guerlain and then their noses they created for me um, two different um, uh, perfumes that we used uh, in a performance uh, in the Palais de Tokyo. Um, yeah, for my Guerrilla Beehive project, the new home for the bees, the refuge of the bees, uh, I was still like it's an ongoing project actually and um, so I had now this new home but I also wanted to um, monitor elements of the ecosystem in, in which um, the, the bees are foraging and I didn't want to do that anymore with conventional technology but I tried to find alternatives with biotechnology because like nowadays bacteria are very often used as um, biosensors or different combinations of bacteria um, because bacteria can grow in colonies and they can develop a specific language which means like of course it's not language with words but it's a, a kind of behavioral language for example changing of colors or this kind of stuff that we can use in monitorings of in my case um, the outside uh, surroundings the foraging fields of um, the honeybees here we have um, a picture of lichen and uh, lichen is also a biopollution used as a biopollution sensor but lichen uh, grow very slowly and therefore uh, the scientists advised me uh, to um, work actually with um, uh, with cyanobacteria to study cyanobacteria and to uh, make them grow in a biofilm um, instead of working with lichen. And here you see different strains of cyanobacteria. Uh, I did this also when I had this residency in the Open Bio Lab. Um, but I tried to grow them in a biofilm, in some kind of skin actually. And this skin, um, I, uh, my idea was to put this skin on the outside then of the beehive. 
and when uh, bees come back from foraging they land first of all on the outside of the beehive so they would land on this biofilm of bacteria and then activate the bacteria and these bacteria would then react if there was some kind of pollution that the bee was bringing with him, of, with her, I have to say with her, um, in her fur. But uh, first of all, I presented my uh, research um, of cyanobacteria in different kinds of installations. Um, this is like, uh, this is called uh, l'origine du monde um, because cyanobacteria were at the origin of our universe. Actually, it's the first bacteria that uh, really uh, grow in um, uh, such uh, big colonies that they provided us oxygen and um, they still do like um, they, they for developing their colonies they take um, CO2 and they uh, by doing photosynthesis so they take the sunlight they take CO2 they need water but they give in return oxygen from their l'origine du monde and um, this is going further in my research of the sensorial skins um, because um, this cyanobacteria I wanted to let them grow also on the sensorial skins of uh, my beehives so because it's easier when you envelop the beehive with the skin and then grow this bacterial uh, colony on top of it so this is uh, part of my research also into uh, growing sensorial skins and uh, work with them, color them with all kinds of organic materials, um, for example cochineal, what you see there, or um, uh, other plant elements. Um, I developed some kind of experimental devices for growing skins during exhibitions. For example, here it's not a chicken, um, but uh, it's uh, some kind of um, small guerrilla beehive that is turning around in um, the culture of kombucha, so the culture of green tea with uh, sugar and um, with the starter of um, uh, bacteria and yeast cells. It's um, turning around and after six weeks I had really a skin around the object. Like um, here you see um, the skin, this is a bigger one, but uh, it was around a similar object that the skin uh, was growing. So uh, it needs air, so therefore uh, it's half above and half in uh, the liquid culture. And um, yeah, it's of course completely wet after uh, you have to take it out and, and make it dry and then uh, you have the skin. Um, besides growing the skins in all kinds of containers, uh, as you see on the left, I also um, was like um, measuring different data when the skin was growing, like um, the most um, important data are um, the temperature of um, the culture and the pH, the acidity. The pH is changing, that is similar to um, what they do with the beer brewing here uh, at the entrance actually. And the third um, sensor that I had inside was an ultrasound um, microphone to take the little bubbling uh, from the fermentation. And then afterwards I used the skins around my uh, guerrilla beehive. Here is uh, a big skin growing and you see really the, the bulbs uh, from the fermentation that is going on. And here we have the action of the yeast um, under, underneath the bacterial cellulosa. And this is then the result. 
as you can see it here. But this ones I, I colored mainly with all kinds of, um, uh, I put different colors in the, in the growing medium already. Yeah, this is also from here. These are biotextiles. It's the ones that you see on the corners of the installation, which are not sensorial skins uh, from kombucha, but it are um, all textiles that I made with um, leftovers that I kept for two months uh, from my kitchen waste, uh, like all kinds of fruit pills, that are uh, grinded and um, uh, that I put um, on the skins that I was making on these biotextiles. It's not bacterial skins. So what, I'm, uh, what I am uh, working on for the moment is um, a project that is called the Song of the Bees. And this is a um, topographic rendering um, that is visualizing uh, yeah, the ecology of the garden. And uh, I do this um, in collaboration with the Textile Lab in Tilburg, uh, Netherlands. Uh, it's a very important uh, laboratory uh, for textile arts, and, uh, which is funded by the state, um, Dutch state. And um, there I'm working on three large tapestries, um, so starting from the information uh, of the garden. And uh, I did tests for now, but the real uh, three pieces will be woven like one of these days. Uh, it's on the program at the end of October. These are all tests. I will make like three different ones, a green one, an orange one and a pink one. And the test that you see here is actually upside down. You have to see it the other way around. Um, this is like a full width, but it's just a cut in the width. You have to see it like that. And um, it will be 170 on 2 meters 30 each of them. Yeah, my last um, contribution is uh, some performances. I will talk about uh, two performances. Um, one that I did with algae, because um, working a lot with the cyanobacteria, which are also uh, algae, microalgae, um, I started to get interested also in the macroalgae. And, um, it's actually a fantastic world when you go beneath the water and it's so beautiful. Um, we, we don't see it and we don't know enough about it. We always see the plants and the forests and everything that is above, but uh, below the water level um, is even more, much, much more, and they provide us with so much oxygen, more oxygen that, than the regular forests uh, give us. So um, I was doing a performance, um, some kind of ritual, durational ritual, at the coast in Belgium. And um, I put um, 30 metal sticks in the water, on which um, I put containers with algae and um, with the tide of the sea. Um, the tide is rather important in, in Belgium, uh, but it goes over four hours. So it was a durational performance of four hours. So the sea was coming closer and closer and every time we were like uh, with five performers, we had to move the sticks with the containers just before that the sea was really on the level of the container and the, that the container would be swept off of the metal stick. So also the people, they came and they, they went and they came back and, and so on. Um, and there were also two performers that were um, doing some um, massages 
uh, with uh, massaging uh, the, the hands of, of uh, the people that wanted to, to have it, uh, with uh, scrubs from algae. And we also made um, a lot of food and teas and other uh, alcoholic drinks also from algae that we offered to the people that came for the performances. And here you see clearly like um, the water is still further away and then how fast actually it was coming and then they had to move all the time actually. Yeah. And then um, the most recent performance is the one that I did um, at the uh, Palais de Tokyo and this one is, um, was completely uh, based upon the behavior of um, the honey, a honeybee colony, how a honeybee colony behaves itself like at the inside of the beehive, the tasks that they do, how they relate to one another and so on. And this also was a durational performance of four hours um, with different elements, different artworks in the performance, um, for example, here was really a play with words and with language. Um, it was also like a, a poem um, on, on the bees and on all elements of the garden. Um, here we see the real bees in action because this film was also uh, projected very large on one of the walls. Um, it's a very short piece that I will show here and yeah, it's, it's in a loop actually but you see how the bees like some of them they are really cleaning the walls other ones they are talking to each other because they are transferring ne nectar to each other other ones the ones in the middle they are building wax and they, they make form this hanging structure to, to build a wax and here um, we see then the performers in action like uh, cleaning the walls of the performance space um, like huddling each other being close to each other like just hanging around this is the end is a short it's the trailer of the video of the performance and uh, that's my la last image, actually. And the title, a bee is a bee is a bee, is like a uh, persiflage on a rose is a rose is a rose from Gertrude Stein, which uh, is a writer that I like very much. And um, it's for me, it's like, okay, you can see it's a bee from so many different approaches. It's still a bee and it's always different and still the same. Hello. Thank you. Thank you.